Thanks, Terry. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here today. As Terry mentioned, back when I was an associate dean, one of the very best parts of my job was I got to come and spend one day each year at each of the regional campuses. So I went to all of them, spent a day, would meet with all the SBS faculty, would talk to students, would talk to deans about what were the plans and how could we make the research, teaching, and service balance better for I, all the faculty, but SBS faculty in particular. For me, this is one of those things where, and I'll probably say some things that are a little bit undiplomatic about the Columbus campus today. Um, as you know, the enthusiasm for the research activities and support for the research activities of regional campus faculty has kind of waxed and waned over the years and depends a little bit on who's in the top jobs up at the very high pay grades, well above my pay grade whether they recognize the real treasure we have here on the regional campuses in terms of the quality and the impact of the research that you do. When people ask me about it, what I say to them was, well, who was on 60 Minutes last year? Was that a Columbus campus faculty member? No, I do believe that was a regional campus faculty member. And you know, the kinds of things that I notice are, We've got a research communications group in the um, university communications office who writes stories about the fabulous research that our faculty do across the whole institution. The percentage of time that that is a regional campus faculty member who's being featured is way higher than your absolute numbers in the population. That says to me, something really special is going on at our regional campuses. I think it's important for those of us who are on the Columbus campus to always keep in mind that you guys really do an amazing thing, which is you juggle a rather heavy teaching load, as you well know, um, heavier service requirements, and general expectations about your availability to students, your general availability to the community that many Columbus campus faculty members are completely unaware of, and many of your department chairs are completely unaware of that. You know, we're acutely aware of the fact that you have to jump through extra hoops for promotion and tenure. We're aware that startup packages can be perhaps not so generous, better than they used to be. We're getting better all the time, but not as generous as we would ever like them to be. So we know that there are some special challenges that you guys deal with every day. That said, one of the things I think we want to emphasize, and one of the reasons that we're here today, is because, yeah, you know, we provide research support services to the whole university, but there's something about being able to put a face with an office. You know, so yeah, you can get access to this stuff over the internet. A lot of our stuff is available electronically. You don't have to get in your car and drive to Columbus. On the other hand, knowing who it is you're talking to, getting a chance to talk to us about the concerns and issues that you have, I think is a big deal. Back when I was an associate dean, I would always meet either individually with faculty if they wanted to or as a group, and they would voice concerns to me. I would go back to the regional campus dean or to the Columbus campus dean and say, this is something we have to fix. This is a problem. We need to fix this. You need to know that you have resources across the whole university not just on your regional campuses, but also um, here in the, in the Columbus group that's here today and our whole office. So the Office of Research, we do two different things in the university. We have you know, very schizophrenic minds and dual missions. One of our missions is to guide the overall course of the research enterprise at Ohio State. And that's going to include now, as we roll out these new discovery themes, finding ways to help faculty navigate whatever the landscape of these discovery themes turns out to be. Um, one of my favorite parts of my job now is the matchmaking part. So people come to me and say, I have this really great research project, but, but I need an epidemiologist. And we say, well, we just happen to know a few. Let's see if we can hook you guys up. Which is why I think, while I'm really glad that some of our research support people can be here today to talk to you, the part of the day that I'm most excited about are the collaboration meetings um, that are going to take place after lunch. 
more and more we find that our research activities are collaborations and not individual, solo, isolated activities. I've been a collaborative researcher my whole life. The stuff that I do, I do um, perceptual interactions in virtual environments. And I can't do what I do without computer scientists and engineers. And you know, they don't think like me. Um, and that's good. Because the fact that we come to the same problem, but we think very differently about it, means that the product we produce is better than anything that we could do individually. We do something better together than we could do alone. And that's the whole point of collaborations, is you can do something better and more exciting together than you ever could alone. So I'm very excited for the afternoon part of the day. I'm very happy that some of my colleagues in research support are, hap are were delighted to come up here today and talk to you guys as well. Um, let me pull up just a couple of PowerPoint slides real quick, just to give you a quick overview of what you're going to see today, because I don't really want to take a lot of time from their show. So some of you who have been new faculty in the last couple years have probably seen some of these slides, because I give a talk every year at the new faculty orientation that takes place when, uh, I was about to say when the quarter starts, but it's when the semester starts. So I don't know about you guys. I don't know how semesters are going for you. Um, I'm teaching my big undergrad class this quarter. I have 100 students, and they're juniors and seniors, right? So the semester shift is kind of a shock to them. It's kind of a shock to me. You know, I went in the first day of class back in August, and I looked at them, and they looked at me, and I said, please don't take this wrong, but you're not supposed to be here yet. Go away and come back in a month. You know, this just can't be right. But we're all kind of getting through it together, this shift to semesters. It seems to be having some impact on research as well. You know, how pe when people are adjusting to the semester system, your research time and your availability for research is altered a little bit too. In some ways for the better, and in some ways, in ways that are more challenging. So, what do we do in the Office of Research? Well, our second mission is to provide research support for everyone in the university. We want to help all the faculty and all the students get research done and achieve the wonderful things that we know they have in them to achieve. So what do we do? We stimulate new research. We help you identify sources of funding. Um, we ensure protections for humans and animals in research. We foster interdisciplinary research. We create opportunities for collaboration. And we promote our technologies and expertise to industry. Um, we try to build collaborative partnerships. We try to shape state and national conversations about research priorities. This is something that Ohio State has not perhaps been as good at in the past, and we're trying to play a little catch up, that we want to have a voice in the national conversations about funding for research and research priorities. We want to be able to have a voice in the state con conversations about that. Um, and although it certainly doesn't seem like it. We are constantly trying to find easier ways for you guys to get your work done. It doesn't seem like it because, of course, we're swimming in a sea of regulatory sharks all the time. And regs are changing. Our approach is we want to help you get your work done, but we want to try and keep you legal in the process, just like that TV commercial, right? We're going to keep you legal. That there are requirements, there are regulations we have as a goal making sure that you guys, when you do your research, are doing it in compliance with all federal regulations. If you're taking care of human subjects, that we're ensuring their safety and welfare. Question? Yes, uh, this term interdisciplinary drives me crazy because it's not clear what the borders of that are. I mean, if you need an epidemiologist and that's part of the research program, that's still a paper in whatever subject it's in. But, I mean, if I consult with a psychologist, then it's interdisciplinary. But if uh, someone in biology needs some, a botanist, it's not. How do you define that? I don't define it. I think the word interdisciplinary and the word multidisciplinary, first of all, they're used interchangeably. They don't mean quite the same thing. I think it's up to the individuals who are collaborating to determine whether the collaboration is interdisciplinary or not. 
um, college boundaries and department boundaries are artificial. You know, and I think in the university of the future, there aren't going to be colleges and departments. They're just going to be people. But this is pressing because what's coming down from above is a directive that there'll be more interdisciplinary research. That's what they're promoting. I don't know who, at what level, what office, but it's in the air. Mm -hmm. Interdisciplinary research, that's what they're going to go to the faculty to do. But I don't know, without a definition of what that means, I don't know what they're telling me to do. Should I go out and consult with people in other disciplines and get them involved in my research program? Or should I just keep, you know, in my little solipsist corner, keep working away at my pro at the problems that my department values me working on? Uh, I, I just don't get how they can, from the top down, dictate that there will be more interdisciplinary research unless it just happens with the creative mind of the faculty. That's, but that's the exactly the way it should be happening. Is, as you said, through the creative efforts of the faculty. Oh, you can't legislate particular kinds of research projects. That never works. That's a bad, bad idea. On the other hand, what I find, particularly in our younger faculty, is these things grow up organically. And again, the definition of interdisciplinary is up to the individuals who are engaging in it. You know, if some of my social psychologist friends want to collaborate with some of my cognitive psychologist friends and they call that interdisciplinary, to them, that is. Now, the piece you're bringing up that, um, and I didn't mean to go so long, but the piece you're bringing up that it is kind of in there, but you haven't said it, is the publishing that comes out of it. Um, that's the part we still haven't quite figured out yet. I was aghast a couple of years ago when I had a panel discussion, and I brought together a group of researchers who were, in my mind, at least somewhat multidisciplinary. There were a couple of sociologists, there was a geographer, and there was a statistician on the project. And we were having this panel discussion, and they asked the statistician, the assistant professor, they said, how does your department view the publications that come out of this collaboration? And she said, oh, my department chair's already told me they don't count. <laughs> and she was untenured. And I'm just going, oh my god, this is bad, 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 right? This is a, an evolving cultural thing at the university. That's the part we still haven't quite figured out, is the publications need to be in high quality outlets. But do they have to be in the three journals that your department has told you are important journals to publish in? That's the part we're still working on. And we're not perfect. We're not there yet. But you can help us in that conversation. I think the more we have demonstrations of truly outstanding research that involve collaborations across disciplines and sometimes broad across disciplines, you know, where a faculty member in dance will be working with a faculty member in computer science, you know, very, very broad. Where do you publish that stuff? You know, and the other thing, I, I think about it because I'm the editor of a journal. It's one of the things I do in my spare time. I edit a journal called Presence Teleoperators and Virtual Environments. And I guarantee you that it is not a journal that is considered to be a mainstream publication in any discipline, because everything in it is very multidisciplinary. This is a tough nut to crack. This is hard. Yeah, Dell. I wanted to also emphasize that um, certainly in other domains outside of quote unquote strict science, but in the arts and humanities, there's also a great deal of emphasis on the individual effort of, of someone. That is a collaboration in any way. It's sort of like, well, then we did work. So there's also, I think, that impediment as well as that there's sort of, if you will, sort of some aspects have been institutionalized within the, do within the academic domain. Yeah, I think you're right. It's the, um, like in social and behavioral sciences, it always was single authored or first authored publications in a set list of journals, depending on the department you were in. In some of our disciplines, and as well as in, say, English and in history, it was book publication. And you weren't supposed to be collaborating on this book with a whole bunch of other people. It was supposed to be your scholarly productivity. And again, I think all of these things are evolving. 
the reason the Office of Research makes an emphasis on interdisciplinary is because we don't belong to any college. We don't belong to any department. And so the place where we can be most helpful is bringing people together that come from different parts of the university. But in the end, I think if you're doing something really exciting, and it's really exciting if you do it yourself, and it really won't get any more exciting by adding collaborators, then you should do it yourself. If there is a piece that's kind of missing, and that this, you know, it's good the way it is, but boy, wouldn't it be awesome if, that's when I think you reach out for collaborators. And these things do have to grow up from the ground up. You can't legislate collaboration from the top down. OK, that's actually a really good question, because I know these are the kinds of issues that we are wrestling with. Um, briefly, when you need to get access to particular types of research support services, we do provide almost everything electronically now. You can visit our website, research.osu.edu. It will give you some news. It will direct you to other places. But one of the places it'll direct you to is Research Online, which is all the electronic support services that we have. So if you are working with animals, if you're working with um, humans, if you need to fill out your conflict of interest disclosure, researchonline.osu.edu points you to all of our electronically available research resources. So that's one that, if you haven't been there recently, we wanted to package this as kind of one-stop shopping, that you pick the one you want, and it'll show you the pieces you need to get that particular aspect of your research done. Some of that you'll hear about today from our other speakers. Um, and this is not in the order that it's going to happen. But Jeff Agnoli is going to talk to you about finding funding. Um, this is one of those environments that we live in now where funding is pretty tight. Federal agencies have tightened up their funding. The state of Ohio has been less generous to universities than perhaps they have been in the past. My philosophy of the world is all money is green. It, it always has been for me. You know, I'm shameless. I'll ask for money from anybody. So you know, is it NIH? Is it NSF? Is it the military? Is it industry? Is it private foundations? Is it the state of Ohio? I've gone with my hat in my hand to all of those entities. Um, because all money is green. Ultimately, the thing that matters is the quality of the work you do. You seek the money if you need the money to get the work done. You know, If you don't need money to get your work done, I think that's lovely, but then don't spend your time going after grants. If you don't need to have grants, don't go after grants just to have grants. Yeah. But what if your department wants you to? <laughs> that's a discussion between you and your department chair, because your department, of course, always wants you to, particularly your chair always wants you to, because we're very good at the university about the pass back of indirects, you know, and so the deans want you to because they need those indirect costs. And in some of the colleges, that, some of that trickles down to the department as well, and so they want your indirects. So yeah, not only do they want you to go after money, but to them, all money is not equally green, because some of these private foundation grants don't pay a lot of indirects. So you're right, there are these um, expectations, let's put it that way. If you don't need money to produce incredible quality work, I think that's a conversation you need to have with your chair. Because in that case, the time you spend writing grants is really not the best use of your time. Actually, can I follow up on that? Sure. So one of the things that we can use on the regional campuses best with grant money is to buy us out from teaching. Uh -huh. But on the other hand, that just gives us time. And of course, we have to put large amounts of time in order to gain funding. Yes. And so it's kind of a zero-sum game. Yes, it is. Um, I don't have any any answer back that says any differently. It is a zero-sum game. And it's in that sense, it's not so different for the Columbus campus faculty member. You put an immense amount of time in writing a grant. And if you get the grant, for many faculty, one of the major goals of getting the grant is to buy out of some teaching time so that you can then actually do the project that you got the grant for. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a fact of being a faculty member. You know, we all are working all the, all the time, you know, working the nights, working the weekends. It is true. OK, so Jeff is going to talk to you a little bit about how to find funding. Yeah. Um, I, I'm encouraged by this talk of partnership and support from 
talk from Columbus and all this. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the talk at university libraries. I'm the director of the Lima Campus Library. Um, where they're re-examining licenses and are going to are planning on cutting off regional campus faculty from databases like JSTOR due to licensing restrictions. I did not know that. It is news to me that they were talking about cutting off regional campus faculty. We don't have a complete list of every database, but I do know JSTOR is one of them. Really? Because so, JSTOR is one of the big ones. Oh, yes, I know. So, um, so how are we going to have these partnerships and research opportunities if we don't have access to the same? materials through university libraries? That is a very good question. What I will need to do is follow up with our colleagues in university libraries, because this is news to me. I did not know this. Um, but you're right. I mean, as a faculty member at Ohio State, you, I mean, one of the prides of the Ohio State system is our online library system. You know, the OCLC system has been just a model for other states. You know, the fact that we were all connected online long before other universities did this. I don't know, I'll have to look into it. I apologize that I didn't know that and so I don't have a good answer for you. Thank you. All right, what else are we gonna hear about this morning? Sponsored programs. Chad Harper is gonna talk to us a little bit about what the Office of Sponsored Programs can do for you. If you're interested in applying for a grant, what pre-award, assistance do they provide you? What kind of post-award assistance do they provide you? Um, Joni Barnard and Tani Prestige from the Office of Responsible Research Practices are going to talk a little bit about human subjects protections. And this is one of the things, as, as a, a faculty member who does research with human subjects all the time, um, being able to pick up the phone and call these guys up when I have to write an IRB protocol, totally helps me and saves me so much pain and effort and mods at the other end of the IRB process. If I just call up and ask some questions in advance, and these guys are always willing to talk to you and work with you, and that's one of the main benefits of having them here today is now you're gonna have a face if you send an email to Joni, you know who she is, and you guys can set up a time to talk and interact to help you work your way through the process of, I want to do this study, but I can't figure out quite how to do it and still stay in compliance with the regulations. Our staff is fabulous at helping you do that stuff. Um, Research compliance. We didn't bring a representative from research compliance with us today, but if you have questions about conflict of interest, about export controls, a lot of people think, oh, you know, nothing I do is subject to export controls. Well, if you travel to give a paper at an international meeting, if you're going to certain locations, you might be subject to export controls. And so you never know in, the, in this landscape. But we all do have to do the conflict, annual conflict of interest disclosures. Um, I don't know if you guys have done it this year. We have a very cool new app. It runs not only on desktops, but it'll run on your tablet. It'll run on your mobile. It's, um, it's quite slick. It's nice to finally be joining the 21st century in terms of technology. Another group we didn't bring today is our group called the Industry Liaison Office. And this is something that the university has been doing more and more of in the last, say, 10 years, is focusing on building collaborations with local industries um, or national industries. We have an office that helps to match the expertise of our faculty with the needs of our industry partners. And this is one of those things, too, where everybody thinks, oh, this doesn't apply to me. Um, well, you know, I'm a psychologist by training, and I'm a lab person. And if anybody had said to me 100 years ago when I was finishing my degree, oh, you're going to be working with Honda R&D, building a driving simulation laboratory, I would have said, I don't think so. But what I can tell you is grand opening of our driving simulation lab is next week. And I've been working with guys from Honda. And we're really excited about the work we're going to do together. It is going to be a fabulous facility. And great research is going to go on there. So never say never when it comes to industry connections. Um, inventors and entrepreneurs, another piece of the university that doesn't report up through us anymore is the Tech Commercialization Office. So if you 
have an invention. And a lot of people think, oh, I'm never going to invent anything. But a surprising number of our invention disclosures each year are resources that people have invented. Maybe it's a software package. Maybe it's a set of materials for a particularly innovative style of teaching. So you might be an inventor and might not even know it. So you know, if you have needs for talking to some of our professionals in the tech commercialization office, it might be more likely to happen than you think. Um, I think all of the folks who talk today are going to talk a little bit about training. Um, the fact that we've got both online and in-person training opportunities available. These are in all kinds of different areas. These are just a few of the ones that we have. Um, and then um, our last speaker of the morning is going to talk about the Undergraduate Research Office. And that's Allison Snow, who is the professor in EEOB and the director of the Undergraduate Research Office. And this is something that I think regional campus faculty do as well as or better than anybody on the Columbus campus. Every year when I go to the Denman Forum, the number of undergraduates from regional campuses who are presenting incredible research projects is just stunning. You guys work with undergraduates on an everyday basis. You know them well. You get them hooked on research. This has always been a passion of mine. Um, I always work with undergrads in the lab. I'm uh, working with um, undergraduate thesis student number 41 this year. So uh, it's, uh, it's been a passion for me the entire time I've been at Ohio State. Working with undergrads, getting them into the research process, gives them an aspect of the undergraduate experience and experience in their discipline that they couldn't possibly get by classroom alone. And you guys do it better than anybody. So that's kind of an overview of what's going to happen this morning. Um, next on our schedule is Jeff Agnoli. Jeff is um, a senior specialist in the Office of Research. And part of his portfolio, he does other things, but part of his portfolio is administering the resources that we have available for helping you find sources of funding. So I'm going to turn things over to Jeff now. Thanks, guys. I'm so glad you're here today. This is a wonderful thing. <laughs>